Hi, this is Scott Pringle with Jacobs. I'm here to give the latest update on the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. This update is for June of 2017. At this point, we have completed the first step of the plan in identifying where the top five regional connections are, and we're getting ready to start step two, which is identifying the modes that best serve those top five connections. There are three primary components to building premium transit. The regional plan is responsible for answering number one, defining that project with enough information to help the region make decisions to answer how it's funded and who's responsible for owning it and operating it. There are three guiding principles to the regional transit feasibility plan. The first is that we're looking for projects that have the greatest potential for both state and federal funding and of course have the greatest potential to be implemented in Tampa Bay. Second, we're looking for projects that make the best use of today's technology and tomorrow's technology. And the third guiding principle, one that we're always going to rely on, is making sure that whatever projects are identified through the plan, that it first and foremost serves our region today while supporting Tampa Bay's growth tomorrow. This slide shows an update to the regional plan schedule. Uh, we've made a slight alteration in how we're coming forward with information this summer. We will be coming back to the TMA with answers on step two in September, and then answers on step three in January. To date, we've held over 55 different presentations and meetings throughout the region with a number of stakeholders, and we've received over 275 comments. The regional plan put out a survey several months ago. We've had over 510 participants respond to that survey, and you can see some of the answers we're receiving here, but really the bottom line is we're hearing the same things we've heard over the past many years. Better access to jobs, making sure it's convenient, and number one, make sure you can get me to my sporting event, to the airport, and again, to my job. In April, we had a great conversation about the data, a little bit of follow-up, a little bit more information on that topic. As you can see here, we are primarily using the MPO projections, but you can see the other data sources. And the reality is when we're looking at 2017 data, they're all very similar. We will continue to look at all the data that's available for us for the regional plan. But moving forward, we're going to use the adopted MPO data because one, it's been publicly vetted. And two, it's required by the federal and state grant application process. To augment that 2017 data, we've also gone and looked at the certificates of occupancy, so where development is occurring or redevelopment is occurring over the last five years. What that does is provide us an opportunity to understand market trends that we've experienced in Tampa Bay. And as you can see here, we have an example for Hillsborough County. Each dot represents one of those certificates over the past five years. You can see a lot of activity in South County, North County, and other areas within Hillsborough County. At this time, we are beginning the process of completing step two, identifying the modes that serve our top five connections. But before we do that, let's go through and talk a little bit about those top five connections as it relates to the federal state grant process. The first rating shown is population density. The FTA defines a certain density of people per square mile, which would give you a high, medium, high, or medium. The goal in every application is to at least get medium or higher. As you can see here, these are all the locations in Tampa Bay that meet those criteria. Pockets in USF, downtown Tampa, West Shore, Largo, Clearwater, St. Petersburg. Likewise, the federal state rating process for employment has the same categories. Again, like I mentioned, you want to be a medium or higher. And with employment, what you want to do is make sure that you're connecting enough job centers to cumulatively meet some of those ratings. 
Now that I've shown you the population density and the employment ratings, let's compare that to what we've identified as those top performing step one connections. Within a half a mile, we serve 87% of the highest density areas, three quarters of the medium and medium high, and almost a half a million jobs. Now let's look at the top performing connections and those critical regional connections. Again, a half a mile from, those, from that vision network, we're serving 87% of the highest density areas, 84% of the medium, medium high, and almost a million jobs within a half mile of that network. At this time, we are beginning to assign modes to those top five connections. And we're gonna do that by really looking at the types of travel occurring within those connections and the people being served by those top five connections. Jobs, work trips, population characteristics, and average trip length. So when we identify that a connection is serving a large number of work trips that are of working age and have longer trip lengths, what that means is we need a mode that can provide a commuter service. When we look at a connection where we're finding a lot of different types of travel in the corridor with a shorter trip length, what that means is we need to look at a mode that can provide better circulation within that connection. So let's talk about West Shore to Brandon. In Brandon, what we're finding is a good mix between professional jobs, commercial and industrial, working age with a longer trip length, and a high number of daily work trips. The downtown Tampa to USF connection has a smaller number of work trips a lot of those work trips are professionals, but we're seeing a lot of different types of trips, not just work trips, with a population that's generally younger and lower income. So this suggests a more of a circulation pattern. Wesley Chapel, USF, Tampa to St. Petersburg, a large number of work trips, a good mix between professionals as well as commercial and industrial employees of working age, much longer trip lengths in this corridor, and an interesting mix of both lower income and higher income residents. Clearwater, Gateway, St. Petersburg, the work trips have a good mix between professional, industrial, and commercial, of working age, lower income, medium length of trip. The Tampa to South Tampa connection a lot of work trips, most of those trips are professionals between the age of 20 to 64, and the majority of those making trips have higher income, and they're making extremely short trips as compared to the other connections. Over the summer, we're going to take this information, we're going to combine it with some more information coming out of our early ridership estimates, and we're going to begin the process of assigning modes to each one of these top five. We will assign up to three modes per connection, and we're gonna primarily be focused on three main categories. We're gonna look at things like ferries and gondolas. We're gonna look at rubber tire solutions, like bus rapid transit, and we're also gonna look at steel wheel solutions, like light rail or commuter rail. On this slide, you can see a number of different examples of those technologies that we'll be looking at over the summer. And you can find this information on our website at tbregionaltransit.com under the Documents tab. We have the honor of having Mr. Booth on our team. Mr. Booth is a widely recognized technical expert, and he works routinely in Washington to help move and guide transit policy in the United States. Jeff provided information to the TMA in June about changes proposed by the current administration. What's really important is we had a good year last year in FY17. Uh, transit was fully funded, capital investment grants were fully funded, that's the good news. We're in the midst of a budget process right now. Congress has to figure out what its budget priorities are going to be and what that means in terms of dollars for defense and domestic spending 
and, and the domestic spending side is critical for the capital investment grants program because unlike the rest of the transit program, which is funded out of the Highway Trust Fund or the Mass Transit Account, or the Highway Trust Fund, the capital investment grants program are funded out of the general fund, which means it competes with other governmental priorities that are funded out of the general fund dollars. So that's why it's a, a focus because that's, we're gonna have to work through the budget process to make sure there's enough general fund monies to fund the program. So that's sort of our initial focus. The challenge we have is, and don't take this as a political statement, it's just an observation, and then for the last six years, if you're a Republican, you can blame the president, you can blame the Senate Democrats because at the end of the day, the president vetoed it. The president was involved, and so the Republicans proposed budgets that were never realistic. This cycle, when you occupy the presidency, the House, and the Senate, you now own the whole process. And so what we're now finding within the Republicans is a recognition. It's going to be really hard to write appropriations bills based on the, the budget targets that have been talked about by the president. So you're generally seeing most every major chairperson of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee are walking back their support for the Trump budget. The same day we had the budget, the Trump infrastructure package was introduced. And I think we need to be very clear about what it is and what it isn't. Okay, when we talk a trillion dollars, first of all, 200, is, is 200 billion dollars of it is new spending, but when you look at the new spending, 105 million is new money and 95 is money taken from the highway trust fund. So 200 million and 200 billion is not 200 billion. Because when you look at the budget numbers and you look at the budget, they're basically proposing a diversion from the highway trust fund to cover the 200 billion that's part of the proposal. Number two, what it is and what it isn't, is that all it assumes increased state and local spending. Because all of it is predicated on you raising your taxes. Sounds like the legislature. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Because every public-private partnership requires a dedicated state and local funding source to repay the debt or to make the availability payments. And so when we talk about $800 billion at the federal level, it's not $800 billion, number one. Because the reality is all the TIFIO program is a loan guarantee. It's, it's support for the loan, but the loan still has to be repaid. Yeah. Or it's a loan guarantee. It's not real money. And the reality is that you're borrowing your own money at a price. And the reason the TIFIO hasn't been used, because it used to be a trillion dollars, it was loaned to $300 million, is because nobody was using it. Why were they not using it? Because when you go to the bond market, you can get a better rate on the bond market that you can't do the treasury to the TIFIA program. And so when we, when we throw those things out there, this program also requires, because of some of the funding components of the program, that we adopt a tax code and revisions to the tax code because one of the proposals in there is to repatriate foreign monies that are currently held by U.S. company corporations overseas, encourage them by a lower tax rate to bring them back into the United States, and then to fund this transportation federal capital revolving fund and to provide the funds to pay for the, this infrastructure plan, well, that requires a change in the tax code. I've been around this and long enough to know that every provision in the tax code has a constituency. And to get it done within a short period of time, this doesn't happen because it takes three years, one, to get the right deal, and two, to let the market respond to the proposed changes. Because the change of the tax code is incredibly disruptive to the private markets. And so businesses need predictability and so it takes time to write the tax code to have that predictability. And so I think it's not going to happen. So I'm highly skeptical that there'll be a there'll be a trust fund. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, as much as we look at the Trump budget, every Obama budget was also dead on arrival. I mean, so every president's budget is dead on arrival because Congress has its own priorities. So Congress has a lot of big issues to work on. And so it, in the midst of this, we have to deal with you know, the annual appropriations process. Now, having said that, everything that we hear on the Capital Investment Grants Program is that there will be a program that will be well above the President's $1.23 billion. And why do I say that? It just so happens that the Gateway Project is in the district of the Chair of the House Appropriations Committee, Rod Frillinghausen, which is in the Capital Investment Grants process right now, and it's hugely important to the state of New Jersey to get this project done to connect to New York City, or provide another access point to New York City. And oh, by the way, in Miami Beach area, 
Mario diaz Bauer has a big smart plan that assumes that there'll be federal match for those monies that once they come off the people's plan, that capacity is freed up. They're assuming federal match for all of those dollars. He just happens to chair the House subcommittee. So we have major players on the committees on the House and Senate side who care a lot about this program, and this program is very politically popular. With that, I, I would just close in saying I am optimistic that there will be a program. <laughs> because, no, because, because history just tells me there will be a program. It, it, it won't be pretty between now and when it gets done, but it will get done. But I think it will get done by the end of the year. And, and I think there will be some cuts, possibly. Maybe taking it down to 2.1 or 2.2 <coughs> billion from the 2.5 that was NFY 17, but there will be a program.